Hi, and welcome back to the Google Gum Electronics Baseline Pick Assembly Language Tutorials. In this lesson, we'll flash an LED. These videos are intended to be a companion to the Baseline Pick Tutorials, which are available as a free download from the Google Gum Electronics website. They go into a lot more detail than is possible in the video lessons, so it's best to download the tutorials, pause the videos whenever you want, and refer to the written lessons to fill in any gaps. In the first lesson, we lit an LED. Now that sounds pretty simple, but it involves setting up the development environment, software and hardware, and learning how to use it, and about the baseline PIC architecture. In this lesson, we'll carry on from there, keeping the same setup and the same PIC, the 10F200. The hard part's over, gets easier from here. We'll use the same circuit as in the last lesson, with the LED is driven by the PIC's GP1 pin. To build this circuit with the baseline PIC training board, just insert the PIC 10F200 into the 10F socket and close the jumper next to the LED labelled GP1. Every other jumper should be left open. OK, let's write the code. In the last lesson, we saw how to set up a new MPLABX project from scratch. But most of the time, you're not going to want to do that. You want to base your code on something that you, or someone else, have written before. To create a new project from an existing one, open MPLABX. If you are recently working on the project you want to copy, it's probably already visible. You can see I already have Lesson 1 here. If not, you need to open it. It might be under Open Recent Project in the File menu, but if not, just open the project and browse to it. I've already got it open, so I'll cancel. Now, just right-click on the project and select Copy. Type in a new project name, and it's a good idea to put the new project in its own folder, so you can browse to an existing folder or make one. Since I've downloaded the tutorials, there's already a Lesson 2 folder there, so I'll just choose that. The new project appears in the Projects window, alongside the old one, but we don't need the old project anymore, so just right-click it and close it. Don't delete it, just close it, so it doesn't appear in the Projects window. When you expand the new project, you'll see that the source file still has the same name as before. But that's easily fixed. Just right-click it, select Rename, and type in the new name. Don't worry about the ASM part, that's done for you automatically. If you now double-click the new source file, you'll see a copy of the code from Lesson 1. Before we add any code to make the LED flash, we'll update the comments. In this lesson, we'll only try to make the LED flash about once a second. We'll worry about exactness later. We're using the same pick as before, and it's configured the same way, so there's no need to change the configuration, calibration, or processor reset sections. And the LED is still connected to the GP1 pin, which has to be configured as an output, so it can drive the LED. Same as in Lesson 1, so we'll keep the piece of initialization code that configures GP1 as an output. In the last lesson, we saw that the GP1 pin is controlled by bit 1 of the GPIO register, and we use this piece of code to set bit 1 which turned on the LED. To turn the LED off again, we need to clear bit 1, which we could do by writing a 0 to it, like this. To flash the LED, we need to turn it on, then off, then on, then off, and so on forever. So we need to put the on and off code into a loop, using a label and a go to. OK, that'll make the LED flash, but way too fast to see. It looks like it's continually on. The pick is clocked at 4 MHz, and it runs instructions at a quarter of the processor clock speed. That's 1 MHz, 1 microsecond, for each instruction cycle. Most instructions run in a single clock cycle, but jumping to another location takes two cycles. So this loop 
the six cycles all up. That's six microseconds each time around the loop. So the LED flashes at 167 kHz. We need to slow it down, a lot. But before we do that, we'll make the code a bit nicer. Instead of using one set of instructions to set bit one, and another to clear it, it's cleaner to toggle it. And to toggle a bit, you can exclusive OR it with one. We can use the XORWF instruction to do that. First, load a bit mask into W, with only the bits we want to toggle set. Then, XORWF GPIO will read the GPIO register and exclusive OR it with the mask in W, which in this case will toggle bit 1. The comma F specifies the instruction destination. F means write to file register, which is GPIO in this case. The other option is W, which means write the result to the W register. So this instruction will read GPIO, toggle bit 1, and write the value with the toggled bit back to GPIO. And in theory, the LED will go from on to off, or off to on. That's the theory anyway. In practice, we need to worry about something called the read modify write problem. You see, when an instruction reads GPIO, it's reading the actual state of the pins. The potential problem is that, even though the pick is trying to make an output go high or low, there might be something external stopping the output from actually changing as expected. Maybe something in the circuit is forcing the pin high or low, or maybe some external capacitance makes the pin's output voltage change slowly. So when the pick writes a 1 to a pin, maybe it's loaded down and reads back as a 0, or maybe it reads as a 0 straight away, but after some time it'll read back as a 1. Either way, you can't count on the exclusive OR instruction actually toggling the output, because what it reads from a pin mightn't be what it last wrote to that pin. This issue doesn't apply to more advanced picks. Both baseline picks, it's best to play safe and write to what's called a shadow register, which is just a copy of what the output should be. Your code should update the shadow register, then copy that register to GPIO. That way, your code never tries to read an output pin, but only ever writes to it. So we'll change the code to use W as a shadow register. XOR LW Exclusive ORs a literal value with W. The value here has bit 1 set, because that's the bit in W that we're going to toggle, and it writes the result back to W. We start with W clear. Instead of using MoveLW to clear it like this, we could use the CLRW instruction. Why two instructions that do the same thing? CLRW sets the Z status flag. Sorry, that's Z for Americans. While MoveLW doesn't. Status flags are bits in the status register, which other instructions can check and act on. As in, was the result zero? If so, do something. We'll see examples of using status flags in later lessons. Okay, that code looks a lot cleaner. But it's not usually practical to use W as the shadow register because so many instructions use it. The shadow value would keep getting overwritten, so we need somewhere safe to store it. We saw in the first lesson that the res directive can be used in the UData section to reserve memory for a variable, like this. Then we can use the CLRF instruction to clear the variable Then move F to copy the contents of the variable to W. Then we operate on W, write the new value with the toggle bit back to the shadow register to update it, and also to the real port register, GPIO, to drive the LED. Okay, that's a nice bit of robust code, but still way too fast. We've got to add a delay to slow it down. Basically, to flash the LED at 1 hertz, we need the pick to sit and do nothing for half a second. Then toggle the LED, 
Then do nothing again for another half second. Toggle the LED again and repeat. So our code will be structured like this. Toggle the LED. Then delay, then repeat forever. Or delay, then toggle, then repeat. Doesn't matter. Baseline picks do have a do nothing instruction. No operation, or NOP. As advertised, it does nothing. But like most instructions, it takes one instruction cycle to execute, or one microsecond. A half second delay is 500,000 microseconds, or 500,000 instruction cycles. That'd be a lot of knobs. The practical answer is to use loops. Then run a few do-nothing instructions, thousands of times each. What's called a busy wait loop. Baseline picks have a couple of instructions that are designed to make it easy to repeat a loop a certain number of times. Deck F has said, and Inc F has said. They decrement, or increment, a file register. In other words, a variable. And when it reaches zero, they skip the next instruction. DECFS said is the easiest to use for a fixed number of iterations. We'll reserve memory for a loop counter variable. Then initialize it with the number of times we want to run the loop. 10 in this case. Note the dot in front of the 10. If you leave it out, the assembler might interpret it as hexadecimal instead of decimal. So it's best to always include the dot to specify a decimal number. We'll just do nothing in this loop, so add a NOP with a label so we can loop back to it. DECF has said decrements the counter, and if it hasn't reached zero yet, the next instruction is run, which is a go-to in this case, to go back to the start of the loop. When the counter reaches zero, the go-to is skipped, and the loop is done. Each time around this loop is four cycles, so ignoring the skipped go-to on the last iteration, and the setup time, the total time is about n times 4 microseconds, where n is the number of iterations. The maximum possible number of iterations is 256, where the loop starts with a counter equal to 0, and it has to be decremented 256 times before it's 0 again. The total time for that loop is 1024 cycles, pretty close to 1 millisecond. That's not 500 milliseconds yet, but we're getting closer. We just need to put this one millisecond delay inside another loop. In fact, since the most we can count up to in one loop is 256, and we need 500 milliseconds, we need to duplicate the one millisecond loop to give two milliseconds in total. Then we'll need to add another counter. So we can repeat the whole thing around 250 times to get 500 milliseconds total. In fact, when you add up all the instruction times, you find that 244 iterations is a total delay of 499,958 cycles. That's pretty close to 500 milliseconds. It can be a bit fiddly get close to the delay that you want. For longer delays, you need yet another loop around the outside. Loops within loops within loops. We'll see more sophisticated ways to add delays in later lessons, but a simple busy wait loop like this does the job here perfectly well. When I build and run the project, the LED flashes at very close to once a second. We have our blinking light. In the next lesson, we'll turn the delay loop into a more general purpose subroutine, and we'll move up to a slightly bigger pick. See you then!